Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fifth season, we are looking at Joe Johnston's 2011 film, Captain America, The First Avenger. I'm Andy Nelson from the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. And I'm Pete Wright. My grandmother's a better podcaster, God rest her soul. <laughs> Today, we are talking about Minute 23, which begins with eager recruits failing to climb the flagpole and ends with Colonel Phillips expressing his doubts to Dr. Erskine. Joining us again on the show today and the rest of the week, we have Father David Mowry returning to discuss this flagpole and this crazy conundrum. Oh, you're saying we're only, we're only halfway through at this flagpole? <laughs> we got to get a home, man. Whew, oh, just give me, give me, I just need to get my win back. I just have to say, Sergeant Duffy, just like this is what I love about this movie by minute format is you get so attached to such small little things in a film. And I just love this character. <laughs> he is just he cracks me up like the he way he's having he's, the time of his life. 17 years. The way that he screams at these these people. It is so great. Uh, you know, we we cut him off as he's as he's screaming at the troops. Um, but from last minute to this minute, come on, get up there. If that's all you've got, then this army's in trouble. <laughs> it's just, it's great. He is having clearly a lot of fun in this part. So, uh, you know, we come in on that and it's just these soldiers. I mean, they just, they can't do it. It's it's great. I love this, this moment that we have here. You need some Three Stooges sound effects underneath this whole scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right you know there is that satisfying section so we get this is you know we get the the actual climb and i love that we have hodge getting up the flagpole and he gets higher than anybody else and then falls satisfyingly that's a good fall and too yeah. it is a good fall and then the mob takes over and we get the whole all of them are trying to you, you know I, I get this little sense that there's this like recreating Iwo Jima <laughs> like every except for <laughs> they're clumsily trying to climb the flagpole mm -hmm. instead of raise the flag and um you know they're terrible at it and we need to see that uh because then we get the little guy get the little so guy you get that comment from Sergeant Duffy about no one's gotten that flag in 17 years which just makes me right. wonder what happened in 1925 <laughs> right <laughs> way what, back was this yeah, was, was this always a camp lehigh thing did they just start doing it in 1925 or was there someone who actually got up that flagpole 17 years ago and was it Sergeant Duffy? It was it Sergeant Duffy. It would be 26. This is actually 1943. Uh, this is 43? Oh, okay. 43. Yeah. It started in 42, but then we jumped to uh, Flag Day 1943 is when they mm. go to the expo. So I, I had always heard it as if the camp has been around for 17 years and no one's done it. Uh, no, the camp, uh, well, according to the flag that we have, the camp's been around since at least 1914. Oh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You picked... No, that's a really good point. 17, you're right. 17 years ago, something happened. It just yeah. occurred to me that the flag has 1914 to 19, what, 42 on 42, it? So they huh? have to make a new flag every year? I, apparently, yeah. It seems kind of silly to have the dates, the, the, the current date printed on the flag. <laughs> they need to write the, just a question mark. <laughs> until 1917. Who knows when? To question mark. 1914 until the eschaton. <laughs> And it makes me and the other thing I wonder about this. So what was the prize for the last 17 years? What, was it always a ride back to camp? Because the way Sergeant frames it, it's like you get to ride back to camp with Agent Carter. All right. So, boys, yeah. get motivated. Right. Like, Everybody was there a sergeant at some point where people are like, oh, that's OK. I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather <Yeah>. run. <laughs> <laughs> rather run than spend, <laughs> spend a car with Sergeant Flatulence. Right, exactly. <laughs> Who was the, the previous sergeant here? Oh, man. Uh, what I love about this character is that there actually was a Sarge who would scream at Roger Rogers in the comics. As, I, as I, we've talked about, in the comics, Captain America is a secret identity. And so he, he's in boot camp. He's like actually here at Camp Lehigh, like everybody else. And he's kind of the guy who accidentally drops his rifle on the Sarge's toes. And it's just, it's, wow, you know, comic book silliness. But I do like that they actually kind of keep that thing going. It's, it's a strange little element, but this Sarge just makes me happy. Now, we talked about uh, this being 
probably something that they did pickups for. And they they must have realized, because if you look at the montage the way we had it, you know, we've got uh, them getting, you know, unpacking, and then we've got the cargo net climb, and we've got them crawling under the barbed wire. And then if they didn't have this, it would go immediately to Agent Carter having them do push-ups. And so we wouldn't have this scene. So what is this scene giving us that uh, that we didn't have otherwise? I was thinking about this yesterday when you mentioned that this is not in the script and it's a pickup shot. I think what this does for us, it establishes that Steve Rogers is not merely a reactionary character. That Steve Rogers is capable of thinking through and approaching problems strategically. So it's not that he's just good and operates out of a kind of knee jerk reaction to something that will happen later this week, but he is capable of looking at a situation and coming at it with lateral thinking. Kind of the like there's more than just the physical nature of it. Like yeah. there's some having brains element to it. Mm -hmm. Pete, any thoughts? Uh, I'm sorry, I got stuck on looking at pictures of Haley Atwell to oh. try and figure out why <laughs> oh, her hair was done the way no. it is. Understandable. <laughs> it you happens were, to the best of us. You are saying the best of I, us. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I actually, uh, I actually had a thought right when you asked it. Now I don't even remember the question. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the the fact that this was pickup. So what is this giving to us that we didn't have? Like, what do you feel we now know about Steve and? Hodge and and uh, Carter from this moment that we didn't have had it gone straight from the barbed wire to the push-ups. Well, one, it's a truth to power moment, and we I, I really like that. Like he is not afraid, even though he is the little guy, he is not afraid to show up a commanding officer and to to risk making them look bad. He's not thinking about it in interests of demonstrating the brain over brawn. Like he just looks at things differently, and maybe that's useful in this man's army. You know that that it is a uh, that he doesn't have to be just um, you know just a pawn. He can actually apply cleverness to it. And I think that's what we need. I don't think we get that in any other uh, any of the other clips in the montage. We don't get him solving the problem of the barbed wire. We don't see him get over the ropes course. We don't see him do anything until this. And I think that's important. We get like like what I was saying, we, we get something active here yeah. instead of something reactionary, because if we just had the later scene, the it would it would appear in the, the text of the movie that the only reason that he is chosen is because he is willing to sacrifice himself. But we need something proactive in Steve Rogers character to prove that this this he really is a good man and he is capable of approaching problems in a different way, which backs up everything that Erskine is trying to say about choosing the, the little guy. Yeah. Well, and to that point, the, the real question for us, I think, after this this is, is it enough to make the case that he should still be there? Because in the last couple of minutes, we're saying, yeah. you know, we should have seen more people flushed out of this program. And so when they sit down on the bed together, you know, and he actually is picked, mm -hmm. is it enough, uh, you know, that that he demonstrated enough cleverness, enough ingenuity to be able to stay? It's there's a lot of questions about the process that they go through and, and what we get. And we definitely will talk about that in a, in a you know, in the coming minutes, uh, some more. Um, I what we also get from this is, I mean, I do like that we do get another chance for Peggy to have this draw to him. She yes. sees that he does this, and he also. I, I just stepping back. I also just going back to Steve. Want to say what's great about this whole thing is there's no showboat moment at all. It's just so casual the way he gives the flag to Sergeant Duffy, and he's just like, uh, you know, thank you, sir, and that's it. And it's just it's so quiet and reserved and it's just it's there. And it's it was a perfect way for him to kind of deliver that. But going back to Carter, it's it's that draw to him from the ingenuity that he had to figure out how to kind of pull the pin and drop the flagpole to get the flag. And also, I think, to see how he reacted to it. I think there are all these things that she's reacting to. It's cute. It's kind of a... <laughs> Like if, if they had just met, it'd be a meet cute, right? We get just a smirk. <laughs> and again, is it enough? Is it her? Is she being sort of self-satisfied that she has a soldier who's willing to make another a commanding officer look like a chump for a second? Is she satisfied at that display of the power dynamic or is she is she crushing? 
and is, you know, as one of, I mean, again, it's her, at least we know it's her, Erskine, and uh, Colonel Phillips, who are yeah. actively watching for, is this a person? Like, which of these right. is potentially the one who will be the super soldier? And, and that so, smirk of hers could represent, oh, I've decided. Of the yeah. three of us, yeah, I yeah, now yeah. have made up my mind. I'm right. locking it in, right. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, because we don't, we don't have any indication uh, from the beginning of this week, where Carter stands on her evaluation of Rogers. It's clear that Erskine is pro Steve and cur- the Colonel is anti Steve. Anti Steve. We yeah. don't nothing where we, we don't have any indication. You know, he is just another man that Carter has to deal with this week. Right. And yeah. his, his and which is, I think, another argument in, in my uh, this burgeoning feud between me and Pete in terms of the, the veracity <laughs> of Carter's love for Steve Rogers. I think that's further proof that there's a real relationship there because Peggy doesn't immediately judge him by his scrawniness. There is no indication from her judging him negatively compared to the other candidates. And what she values here is his mind. He val- She values his capacity to work within the limitations of his own physique and she's she's clearly impressed by it in, and yes. like hey yeah look at look at this guy sergeant yeah. duffy he's kind of making you look like a fool i, I, I like this guy i like the cut of his chip <laughs> you you've made a valiant case i would just say that everything you just said all we have to do is add for science to the end of it <laughs> and i think we'll have my view of her perspective <laughs> Do and then <laughs> and then she's a, she's a great precursor then to Jane, and uh, I love it. I love that yes. <laughs> we mm-hmm. we found yeah. a lead from from that character to this one. That's right. Um, and you know, I don't know if it, there's enough there, but we do get a, a shot of Hodge as he actually notices this as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, in context of what they're setting up, I don't know. It's interesting. There, it feels like they're actually working to set something up between these characters. Like at some yes. point there's going to be some confrontation between them. It never comes, but it is interesting that we kind of have these moments um, with Hodge uh, kind of watching with a look on his face. Yeah, Hodge is serving an archetypal role here. He is just the masculine ideal who is disapproving of Steve Rogers and um, his purpose in the story is just to be a bully. And that's it. Well, it, it would be it, I don't know, it would be an interesting turn if at the end of the the first part of this movie, when we go to war, if Hodge ends up on the crew and maybe that look in the in the in the, you know, in the in the background is some indication that, oh, maybe I'll follow this man into battle. You know, like there is that sort of affinity that is starting to grow and not not necessarily something of, um, you know, of jealousy or you know, that kind of thing. Well, and I believe we will see him in the field when, if I recall, and I'm going to have to, you know, go check myself on this, but I believe he's there when um, Steve is coming back with all the troops that he's saved. So that that was my memory of it, but I didn't yeah, want to, yeah. I didn't want to say anything and make myself look bad later. I was going to leave that up to Well, we'll just, you. we'll, we'll have to, yeah. <laughs> the only, <laughs> you know, thank you. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> I always got on here. Always <laughs> out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so we've got this uh, this brief little moment here, and then um, we cut to uh, we cut to Carter running a you know push ups. She's having everybody do push ups. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I go back to like, what are their roles? Because if if they're actively looking, like, shouldn't I don't know? I I think of like you know, in theater and stuff like that, where you have people running drills or whatever, but like the the person who's actually looking for people, like who are they going to cast, are kind of stepping back and just kind of observing and watching and stuff. But she's actively in here running this drill and uh, I guess, you know, you know, calling it out again, um, calls them ladies. So is that ladies number two? The ladies count is now at two. But does it make it okay that it's a lady diminishing her own gender? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that's okay. <laughs> I don't think that's okay. I think I think Peggy Carter is better than that. And I would want to call her to something higher. Yes. And, I mean, Peggy. the joke about her grandmother is very funny. I do like that joke. <laughs> that my, she's so complete. God rest her soul. <laughs> my grandmother has more life than you all. God rest her soul. Like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, so I think there is a missed opportunity here to 
create a fuller sense of the training that these men are going through, because it's all been physical up to this point. It would be interesting if Agent Carter was doing some kind of like um, a room clearing drill or some kind of tactical work with the soldiers. Are they able to execute some kind of, you know, step by step drill where they have to you know, back each other up, do squad tactics or leadership formation or, or something else? It would, it would make more sense for this to be Sergeant Duffy. And then narratively, we know why she is here, as we'll see at the end of the week. Um, so it, it's just I think. Part of it, if we're going to no prize, the answer here is that the SSR is just, just kind of loosey goosey. Just kind of everyone has to do everything because it, it's a little bit of a ramshackle operation right now. Very much so. But, it, but it, it, doesn't it feel like just basic training again? And like, I mean, they're just yeah. doing push ups. And, and to mm-hmm. your point, and like, then yeah. behind them, there are the guys with the telephone poles doing the <laughs> lifting from yeah. their shoulder yeah. to shoulder. Like, there's definitely some basic training going on in mm-hmm. here. People are getting, you know, shelled. The question is for me is like at the end of the minute, are there fewer guys doing push-ups than there were at the beginning of the last minute? Well, at the, at, in the line, when we saw them, there were only, I mean, that we could see, we could only see about nine people in the line. So mm, it yep. wasn't a, a huge group. And then when they're at the flagpole, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, like 12. So, you know, I mean, so it's, if anything, it's growing. <laughs> Or at least we're seeing more. (laughs) Are they even (laughs) counting people every morning? They just keep adding something. Ah, here's a soldier who complimented (laughs) me on how shiny my boots were. So we're going to consider him for the training as well. Welcome to the SSR, soldier. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. In the push-ups, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We see at least nine in this minute. We'll see some more Mm -hmm. in the next minute. So, um, So, yeah, I don't think any, like, I just don't think anyone is getting whittled out. I think... It, I don't know. I'm, I think that it's a little confused but in the script and what the filmmakers were actually doing here because it's really designed like basic training. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like that's what they're putting these people through, and then they're just picking someone in there. It doesn't actually feel like they are working on testing people to figure out who really is the perfect person to be our super soldier. Yeah. If you had more, this is already a pretty lengthy movie, but if you had a little more time to work with, I think this whole sequence would work better as a kind of blind test where you have all these men going through basic training and there, there's like weird things we're going to ask you to do. Like, why are they asking us to do this? This is odd. And in those weird things, that's where Steve excels. And then at the end, it's revealed like, well, this was all you know, candidacy for this big program, telling the candidates up front expedites the narrative process for the audience, but does, you know, on minute by minute, create these questions about (laughs) the testing process overall. Like, it seems like you should be weeding these guys out and just moving them along if they're not in contention. But it is, again, it's only a week, so it's not like they're spending a lot of time on it. At some point, I really want a Dr. Venkman style test. Like, what's on the other side of this card? And then an electrocution. Like, we need <laughs> those sorts of tests yeah, to capture exactly. the entire scope of the applicant. And I, and I would love that because that would play into the mad science we're yes. going to see with Stark a little later on. And it would be great to see a little a little more pulpiness in this because this is, this is a pulpy movie. And I think you need a little bit more of it to set apart why this whole process is strange and what they're looking for is, is something beyond the physical to kind of back up what Erskine uh, says yeah. later on this right. week. Yeah, it's it's that whole idea. Of it. Have you seen the movie Exam? Are you familiar with that film? No. It's a really interesting movie where it's like, I, I don't know, it's like 10 people or something that, that they show up. In, it's, it's like all takes place in one room. They show up to apply for this very high-end, mysterious job working for this company And you basically like they have a piece of paper in front of them and they have to they have one question and they have to answer this one question and they and that's it. But they all flip over their paper and it's all blank. And so and they can't leave the room or they're instantly disqualified. And so they have to go through this whole process of figuring out. And it's it's like this very complicated process of like, what is this exam? And and it's I don't know, it's a really fascinating film as they kind of explore it. But that's that's kind of what I want here is like something a little more complicated to figure out this this super soldier other than just uh, basic training. And and to bring it back to a, a franchise, I know I said I would let go of it, but I'm going to bring up Men in Black again. The Men in Black <laughs> sequence did this really well. 
right? Because that training montage revealed that the agency is looking for something different than all these other candidates thought the test was about, which is why uh, Agent um, Will Smith, I can't remember his character's name now because it's CJ? just Will Smith. He's, He's just playing himself. He's Agent J. J. Yeah. Yeah. A- yeah. Agent J, that's why he passes, because he has that different thing that the test is actually looking for. But this is just played so straight as basic training. It, you don't get that uh, that kind of character overcoming the, the secret test that no one else knew about. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to talk more about all of this. We have a, a, a small start of a conversation between Erskine and Phillips as they're kind of <laughs> it's it's great because it, there's really you're really seeing the doubt that uh, that Colonel Phillips has in Rogers and the absolute confidence that Erskine has. I mean, we don't get the full sentence, but I am more than just thinking about that. He's really there's something going on with this Erskine. He's he's convinced that that <laughs> Rogers is his guy. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I any last thoughts from either of you before we jump into the Christ in the Cape? Who's where, I think my question is who's going to wear the cape this time this the, today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the question who's in the cape? Well, let's find out. Take it away. Well, for today's uh, installment of, of Christ and the Cape, I want to talk about theological anthropology, kind of that understanding of the human person from a theological perspective. And for this movie, uh, this, especially, we get a little bit at the end of this week, but for next week's minutes, I just want to frame uh, the conversation around this conversation around goodness, because that is the thing that Erskine is looking for. He's looking for a good man. And that is a moral quality, that a good person is someone who does good things. In comic book world, that is a rigid characteristic. Someone is either good or they are bad. And if they switch, it they switch all the way. You flip the switch and all of a sudden they're bad. There is very little nuance in terms of the moral life of comic book characters, which is fine. That The, the genre is what it is. It's not interested in asking those questions all the time. And in this movie, that same kind of moral logic carries over. Steve is good. And like I said before, Bucky tries to suggest this kind of moral nuance to Steve's position. You know, Are you sure you don't have something to prove. But uh, in the movie's answer to that question is, no, he doesn't have anything to prove. He is that good. There is no (laughs) temptation to power. There's no temptation to abuse once Steve becomes Captain America. And as I'll talk about later in the week, in fact, his response to the power is a further uh, heightening of that that question of why me? Uh, There's a sense of, okay, I've been given this for a reason. I'm not using it the way I'm supposed to. Um, Rogers is a good man and he becomes great. And same thing with Hodge. Hodge is already a bully and he would only become worse with the super serum. Uh, And that kind of, of course, that kind of black and white morality is not how people are. We are we are a mass of contradictions. We are good in some areas and bad in others. And we're all, as as one of my seminary professors said, there's no such thing as a done muffin. We're all in the process of being <laughs> fully baked. Where some of us are a little mushy in the middle still. <laughs> and in terms of anthropology, you can see that even in Scripture itself, uh, we mentioned the 12 men climbing the flagpole, which, of course, for me as a Catholic, makes me think of the 12 apostles. And they were definitely a mixed bag. There were Not all of them were moral paragons. And one of the things that I love pointing out to people is that in the pages of the gospel, before you get to the Last Supper, the apostles are sent out to do the work of Jesus, to preach, to heal the sick, and to drive out demons. And that includes Judas Iscariot the man who betrays Jesus. There's no indication in the Gospels that Judas can't do what the other apostles do because he's he's a mustache-twirling villain. No, Judas is a legitimate apostle. He goes out, he heals the sick, he drives out demons, he does the work of the apostles, even though he's going to make a bad decision to betray his rabbi, teacher, and friend at the end of the Gospel story. So even in the page of the Gospel, you, you have this sense that morally, we are complicated. It's possible for us to backslide. It's possible also for us to convert, as you see in Peter, who is able to ask for forgiveness and be redeemed for his own denial of Jesus. And so in in light of that, in light of what this program is looking for, it's looking for a good man. First, it's, it's pretty clear that Erskine is in charge because the way the colonel frames the question in this situation, it's not as though the colonel is going to pick someone and Erskine can have some input on it. No, Erskine is picking someone. The colonel is going to advocate for Hodge, and we'll, as we'll see tomorrow, but it's Erskine's decision, which says, okay, if, if it's Erskine's program, 
wouldn't he be in charge of how the candidates are processed? So wouldn't <laughs> there be uh, it wouldn't the candidates be well suited by having some, I don't know, some ethics classes, some training in virtue, some training in some philosophy and, and using that sense of of looking for something beyond the physical. It's clear that he gets the last word on the choice of candidate. So that uh, that again speaks to what I would like to see more out of this this training montage. Yeah, have the classic army stuff and show that's where Steve fails, but then show these uh, conversations around morality or philosophy and let Steve show that strength of virtue in other places that again can back up what Erskine is saying because we're we're told and not shown as much as as I would like from this particular scenario. And that would help us really believe in the goodness of Steve Rogers, because we just kind of have to take it on face value that, OK, here's a guy who doesn't abuse the power he's given. And without seeing a lot of that other than confronting the bully in the theater, uh, it we just kind of have to accept that as a static part of the character instead of something that's living and breathing. So I know I personally, I would love for there to be a great big switch of morality and just to kind of lock it into good and then just not have to worry about it anymore. But gosh, darn it, we're we're made with free will. And so that just makes things oh so complicated. <laughs> well, and and there will be more interesting, you know, points to discuss as to, you know, Steve Rogers and all of that in later films. But yes, in this film, mm. it is very, very cut and dry with this guy. But it works in context of what they need to set up for him for later. So, uh, all right, fantastic minute. And we're certainly getting into some more stuff in these next couple. So um, why don't you remind everybody where they can learn more about you, Father David? If you're interested in something a little more... Uh bite-sized chunks. Uh, I do have a Twitter. I, I don't use it all that much, but you can find me on Twitter at Father Maury. That's at F-R-M-O-W-R-Y. Um, mostly it's me. Uh, <laughs> you're just liking a bunch of nerdy stuff and uh, retweeting all my friends who are in the movies by minutes world. But you know, every so often there's something else on there. So if you want to if you want to uh, at me about the Christ in the Cape stuff that I've talked about this week, be happy to continue the conversation with you there. Fantastic. Come, come at me, says Father <laughs> Maury. Come at me. Come on, me. Come on. Oh, it's just social media. How bad can it be? Bring That's it on. Right. <laughs> 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 well, you can you can find our socials, uh, our access to our Discord, uh, learn more about membership and merch, all that stuff at truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute. Uh, that's it. We'll be back tomorrow for Minute 24. So, Pete, thanks as always. Not only am I thinking about it, I've been journaling about it and dreaming about it, and I write it in doodles on my forms. <laughs> I love it. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Spread the News by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. <laughs>